Welcome back. Another episode of Indisputable with Dr. Richie. I'm filling it in. I'm Mundell Robinson. I'm, I am luckily, luckily, and happy, happy, happy to be joined by Sharon Reed, the ever, ever comfortable Sharon Reed. How are you, sis? I'm doing well, and it's election day. And I should tell people before we went on, I said, well, you look very electionist, Mayor. So we'll <laughs> see what happens today. But you look the part. Thank you so much. I, it is election day in North Carolina and other states. So people talk about off years, we don't have them. We have a busy day. Um, so let's jump right in. And, and we start off with a doozy. A cop who shot a black hero lost his job after hateful text messages. Mark McInera, a San Jose police officer, has been exposed after sending a slew of racist text messages about a black hero he shot. That's right, he shot him. And now he has been reportedly he actually reportedly resigned from the department. According to a November 3rd press release from San Jose Police Department, McNamara allegedly sent a text message to another department employee who is currently on administrative leave amid an internal investigation. The exchange, the exchange came at the, uh, the March 27, 2022 shooting of a community college football player, Kayon Green, who is still recovering from his injuries. Details of the shooting. Green was inside La Victoria Taqueria with uh, his friends when a random man walked into the restaurant and threatened the group. The man left the establishment, returned with two other people, and one pulled out a gun, sparking a, phys a physical altercation. Green's attorney argued that he was acting in self-defense. He wrestled a gun away from the guy, according to his attorney, who was Adante Pointer. Um, and he told this to the local news, and we got it covered from Atlanta Blackstar. So what you see here is a young man who, who sprang into action to defend himself, himself and others, and was backing away, creating space between him and the gunman who was trying to talk or take the gun back from him, trying to de-escalate the situation. As he was exiting the restaurant with the gun, he was shot multiple times by police. They believed he was linked to a homicide that happened nearby. Green was arrested and transported to a local hospital. When police realized he was not the suspect, they arrested and charged another man. Green filed a lawsuit against the city and the department last year. McNamara was identified as the officer who shot the student athlete. In a text message revealed by the department last week, he spoke about Green a day after the shooting. The N-word, he said, he didn't say N-word, he said the actual word. N-word wanted to carry a gun in the wild, in the wild west, not on my watch. Ha uh, ha. Uh. He allegedly wrote in a, a message to another. He also said, I hate black people. Uh, Pointer called, Pointer, of course, is the lawyer for uh, Green. Pointer called the dialogue disgusting and vile. According to KGO TV, they are, they are calling for criminal charges to be filed against him and wanted to stop him from being rehired. At one point, McNamara seemingly texted that Green's attorney should be bowing to me and bringing him gifts. Otherwise, he would have lived a life of poverty and crime. Uh, Jesus Christ, this is this is ugly and nasty, but it is the state we find ourselves in. Chief uh, Chief Anthony Mata condemned the messages, adding that his department has no room for racial bias. They found the messages while conducting an unrelated investigation. Green, who spoke for the first time Sunday about the incident, uh, said, sat by his attorney at a news conference and said, in their opinion, the former officer should face attempted murder and hate crimes. Let me stop right here. The fact that uh, this person is telling the, the, the district attorney that someone who shot him multiple times should face uh, attempted murder charges and hate crimes is a no brainer. Unfortunately, in this country, we know so often that black men get shot by police officers more than anybody else. This is not an opinion, this is a fact. Black men are shot by more than anybody else, whether they're armed or unarmed. Um, and then to couple that with the fact that we have the text messages of how this officer feels about not just green, but all black people. And also thinking that him shooting this, this uh, young man, this hero who protected himself and others from an armed assailant uh, should be bowing to him is absolutely disgusting. For sure, but it's also par for the course. We can't say that this is a bad apple. We can't say that this is a mistake. We have to address the fact that this continues to happen in our country, in these United States. So often, Sharon, that we are forced to say that this is the status quo. Yeah, America, look at your life. And it's so important um, that we continue to talk about it, no matter 
the fatigue of everyone else. If anybody should be fatigued, it should be black people in America. But I have to tell you, Mayor, I'll address the easy part first. Chief, you do have room for bias and hate in your department, okay? Because the former officer who was allowed to resign wasn't texting himself, Mayor, okay? And I'm sure when you talk like that, it's not a one off, okay? You didn't take, I don't know, remember people were taking Ambien and getting in the car and they couldn't remember where they were going. It's not a case of that. It's not a case of that. If I didn't know any better, I would think that this person took an oath, went through the training, all of it, got a weapon, put his hand up, only to hurt black people. <laughs> That's, I would actually think that, and I think I have a shot at being correct. I mean, and it's not far fetched when you see how he feels. And we also know the history of policing in this company. I mean, this country actually it's the only job in this country where you can kill black men. And because of qualified immunity, most of the time we know that you're not going to be charged with anything, right? It is so commonplace that this has not happened. Let me, let me get some more into what Green had to say. Uh, Green also spoke on a personal level saying how the officer's word made him feel. It pains me to know how much hate someone has in their heart. This is what Green said. I went in there to help and I came out there needing help, almost kill. Green added that it's scary to think that McNamara would have shot others or, uh, around him. Listen, the, 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 sc the scary part about this is this person was arrested not because he shot this man. He was arrested because of the text messages. And the sad part about it is they found his text messages because of another investigation. And like you said, Sharon, this is not small. You don't just out of the blue start texting your coworkers that you hate black people and using the N-word. You don't just text coworkers out of the blue these things. This is a this is a commonplace. And that chief can say what needs to be said at this moment. But this is absolutely, I guarantee, not the only officer that believes and behave in this manner. And I bet you, if you dig deeper, this is not the first time that this has been brought to this chief's attention that this officer is what they call a bad apple. Sharon? Yeah, that part, Mayor, and I was going to go there with the chief again, because I don't see a leader here. And maybe it's just because I'm jaded. I've been a reporter too long, but my reporter spidey sense tells me that these text messages that were found were not just turned over because people have integrity. They were likely turned over because other people saw them that weren't going to keep quiet. Other people knew about them, and it was going to come out anyway. Again, maybe I'm just cynical. A reporter here, but I just want to know a time when black men, black children are going to get the benefit of the doubt. As I look back at you, the mayor of Enfield, North Carolina, I got to tell you, I worry about you. I really worry about you. That could be you. It could be me. It could be any of our loved ones. For what? I'm glad you called him a hero. For what? Indeed, and, and that, that, is a, that is a wonderful fact to point out to people. Black men continually are brutalized uh, by, by the system. And, and in this case, police. Black man brutalized in a wrongful arrest receives $500,000 from uh, a city in South Carolina. Attorneys for Travis Price, a black man who was wrongfully arrested more than two years ago, say their client has come to terms on a $500,000 settlement for his lawsuit against the city of Rock Hill, South Carolina. For people that don't know, Rock Hill, South Carolina is right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. It might as well be Charlotte. Uh, per WCNC, Price settlement is one of the largest in the city's history. According to copy of the complaint obtained by Atlanta Black Star, on June 23rd, 2021, Price was driving home when he saw that his brother Ricky Price was being arrested at a gas station. He pulled into the parking lot and approached uh, where officers were holding Ricky. The officers ordered Price to stand by while they removed Ricky's handcuffs so they could give him a, his brother's jury. This is according to the Black Star. Uh, Atlanta Black Star. Simultaneously, according to the complaint, Rocky officer Jonathan Marano was executing a search uh, a search warrant of, of Ricky's car, a search of Ricky's car. When he was when he finished, he approached a group of and allegedly attacked Price without cause of legal justification. A bystander's video show Moreno on top of Price while he is lying on the concrete. The officers struggle to restrain Ricky, who noticed uh, what is happening to his brother. And this, of course, is again, again, according to Atlanta Black Star, and we actually have attained some video about that. So let's let's take a look at this video. Hey, 
This how Rocky will do you, y'all. What is he doing to him? What is he doing to him? I got it on camera. I got it on camera. He ain't doing nothing, y'all. I don't care. Look at this. Look at this, y'all. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look at this dog. Look at this. He ain't doing nothing. Y'all, look. He not doing nothing. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Somebody come help them. He ain't even do. Look at him, y'all. Look at the police. Look at the police. He got him on a fight. Travis is a good boy. He is, he is a good boy. Look how they tasing him, y'all. I'm getting close. Look how they beating his ass. This is this is this is so ridiculous and also so American. The cameras don't stop them. We know that. We watched them choke George Floyd with their knee on his neck and their hands in their pocket. And the movement that came after it wasn't enough. Because if you look at each year since George Floyd's murder, the, the police killing black men has went up. What we just watched is gang style beating sanctioned by the United States government, in this case, Rock Hill, South Carolina. According to Atlanta Black Star, Price was choked, physically assaulted, slammed to the pavement with great force, handcuffed, and placed under arrest. The complaints say throughout the assault, Price attempted on multiple occasions to inform Morano that he was merely doing what other city officers had instructed him to do. Price kept his hands in the air in a non-threatening manner, and Price at no time attempted to nor, uh, to nor I'm sorry, nor did he make a physical contact with Morano or any of the other officers. Price stated that he was complying, was not resisting arrest, and he had not, he had not done anything wrong. We watched that. We know that. Following the incident, Price was charged with hindering police, but was later cleared of wrongdoing. However, per his lawsuit, the city attempted to disparage him in their statements about the incident as it alleged he was uncooperative, shoved officers, and yelled belligerently. Yelled belligerently. It is only, this is only telling of what the South, what America believes black men can and can't do. Basically, you cannot stand up or speak out against white men. And when you do, even though he wasn't yelling belligerently, the fact that he was standing straight, the fact that he would dare stop and see why his brother has been arrested. All of that is questioning the establishment in a way that, des that makes him deserving of the ass whooping we just watched. Say what you want. This is America. This is commonplace. This is commonplace, and these videos don't stop it. So all these people say, at least we got videos of it. We had videos of Bloody Sunday, y'all. Bloody Sundays happened in the 60s. We still got cops hitting people across the head with nightsticks and further punching them in their face, beating them as if we are animals. And in most cases, some cases, shooting them to their dead. Sharon, what do you say about this? Well, I'd start with this. Look at how the conversation pivots even. Look at where they have a starting. Uh, we're literally arguing over the fact where they want us to, whether this black man was perfect enough to not deserve a beating. Wouldn't you be belligerent if you were getting mixed signals and then they tased your ass? Wouldn't you be belligerent? This small city in South Carolina, and you'd know better than I, and Mayor, I don't know why I always think you're the expert on everything in the South, but you know a lot. They pride themselves. They even have a mural in front of the Mercantile, I think it is, honoring the Friendship Nine who sat in at that lunch counter all about desegregating things. It was a test case and it picked up momentum from there. And they had that mural. No room for racism. There's plenty. Again, I don't fault the people who want to honor history and brave people who came before them. But there is plenty of room for racism in Rock Hill because we just watched it. 
That's not an isolated incident. That's not a misunderstanding. When you beat the you know what out of someone, really on first sight, that's what it's called. Racism. I don't believe a white woman would be treated that way. And nowhere in there did I say they've never been treated that way. I just mean it's commonplace for us to have to deal with this, doing the right thing. I want to get to a place in America that I don't know we'll get to in my lifetime or perhaps my daughter's, where you can actually do the wrong thing and not get your ass beat. Indeed, I mean, and we and we see that it, we see instances where people do the wrong thing and still don't get handled and treated this way. Unfortunately, they don't look like us. Uh, but this is not it. The city's the city's false statements would be reported by media outlets and amplified by officials like uh, Rep. Representative Ralph Norman, while Norman, who is uh, also listed as a defendant in the complaint, updated his post days later, he failed to retract his original defamatory statement, which led to a wave of comments attacking Price. As for the officer Morano, uh, he was fired from the department and charged with third degree assault and battery. But a jury, of course, a jury found him not guilty last year. Listen to me. This we have to re- we have to remind people sharing on a regular basis and people may say Mondale is a broken record when it comes to policing and black bodies we have to remind people that to be black in america and interact with police officer is almost a death sentence surefire the fact that juries don't defend or see guilt in what we just watched is absolutely baffling to me sharon i'm going to give it to you before we go to break Well, that's because these juries are by and large looking for ways to exonerate the indefensible. They're actually looking for it. And the civil rights lessons we learned, the painful ones, Medgar Evers, the rest, these are the lessons that are being played out again today. They're looking for ways to clear white people because our blood is not worth anything. Black skin, black trauma is not as important or even worth noting sometimes. So of course, walked three and third degree assault. Give me a break, really? And the media, hey, I had these fights all the time, Mayor, all the time in the newsroom. I just wanted to tell the truth. And a police statement where someone's convicted that they handed me across the desk is not the truth. It's, it's an element that needs to be qualified. And we know too often police lie. Yeah, I said it, they, they do lie, you know. Too often, not isolated, as you said, not bad apples. This is what we're working with. And I, I think it's a shame that I need to say this, but I, I just had, I had a confrontation this morning at the poll that that I was just sparked about. Um, wow. Somebody told me that I show up as racist because I point out the things that have happened to black people in the past as it pertains to white supremacy and are still happening and their connections between the two. I want to say this, and I don't normally say this. Uh, I, I, we, if if you are a white person and you are offended that we are talking about the policing system in this in this light and also all of the systems that oppress black people and other folk of color and other minorities in this country i think you need to do a self check mm-hmm. honestly because you may be harboring something what makes you believe that you are responsible for the targeting and harm that black people feel and go through unless you are okay with it so that's something you should think about while we take a break we'll be back sharon reed the wonderful sharon reed and monday robinson filling in for dr richie We're back, Sharon Reed and myself, uh, filling in for Dr. Rich on Indisputable. Guess what, y'all? Right now, you can get a signed copy of Ada Rodriguez's book, Legitimate Kid, at shoptyt.com. That's right. In this book, Ada shares her stories of how she overcame hardships and transformed transform her pain into laughter. So go right now to shoptyt.com and grab the signed copy. That ain't it. The third GOP debate is about to happen. And guess what? We're going to cover it. The third Republican debate is happening in Miami tomorrow. Join J.R. Jackson, Brent Eldridge, and John. Oh, John's back. Daddy Dragon is back, y'all, as they pick up the night's biggest winner and loser and discuss the debate. So tune in to on tyt.com backslash live on YouTube, Facebook, or on Samsung TV Plus, on Roku, and other uh, linear platforms at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. 
specific time. Don't don't miss that. That's sure to be interesting. We're going to have extended coverage for our members. So if you sign up to get access at tyt.com slash join, you're going to get that extended coverage for sure. Let's go see what our, our viewers are talking about. Over on YouTube, we see Tala Hackney, who's been a member for 13 months. Thank you so much, brother. We appreciate it. We love you. Um, he has family in Virginia, and I hope they vote. Love y'all. Yeah, if y'all don't know, Virginia is one of those states, Virginia, Kentucky, are one of those states that on um, what people call all fears, they elect their entire uh legislature. So uh, we are, we know Virginia is an important state and they are, they have a lot of elections today. So people should definitely get out and vote. If you're watching from Virginia, if you know someone like Tyler who has family in Virginia, please reach out to them and remind them that Virginia is, whether the, the Democratic Party says it or not, is a bellwether state and we're watching what will happen. Uh, over continuing on YouTube, as it pertains to the cop who lost their job over the, ra the racist text, the chip said, okay, resigned. So, he, he can go elsewhere. And that is exactly right. This person was allowed to resign after he shot someone, sent those text messages, racist, blatant, racially text messages. Um, he can get hired in another police uh, department. We saw the same thing. Even, even when they're fired, they're allowed to be hired. Tamir Rice, 12 year old, shot in Ohio, killed by an officer. That officer was able to go somewhere else and get a job. Scott Smith, still on YouTube, said the Second Amendment never seems to apply to someone with dark skin. You should also know that the Second Amendment was written just to separate white people from black people. It was one of those rights that were given to white people at the Bacon Rebellion where poor black people and poor white people got together and said, we are tired of the rich elite controlling us, changing white people's time when they couldn't be, or how long they would be in ditched service. That was a right they gave them. They also gave them the right to marry. So you're absolutely right. The Second Amendment has never and will never, as long as we see it as we see it, apply to black people. Let's go over to Twitch real quick. And we see uh, Najeli said, every day I'm disillusioned more with police. And we we should all be disillusioned with the way we do policing in this country. We we lock up more people. Our crime rate, as it pertains to guns, are higher than other countries. And it's only because of this one qualified immunity that we have and also the failures in our system that are baked in in how policing work. So that is absolutely trip. Let's go to back to the show and guess what y'all? I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. I turn this into corporate. That's, that's just that's not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This this Walmart you right here. You turn me into corporate. This Walmart. Yeah. Because unless you're spending money, uh -huh. we don't need. Oh, we not. I'm not spending money. Am I because uh, I'm know, black? Uh, what do we do? Because I'm black. Third group of people tonight. I've had to chase away because they think Walmart is a playground. And what did I do? What did, hold on, hold on. Let me say this. What did I do to make this a playground, yeah, man? Okay. What have I done to make this a playground? To come in and browse and backpacks. They don't, they don't, they ask them if you, they take yeah, their backpacks. Yeah, and then we, then we have a problem. You can't assume. No, no, wait, let her talk, let her talk, let it her bear herself. No, it doesn't. I asked them to take their backpacks out. and they I will not them. have him treating me like that. If you don't stand up, you've got superior no. cancer too. No. Now you take care of him. No, oh, Mary, okay. I'll take care of you. What? No. Wow. Oh, this you got superior stance. What? He will not you. treat me like this. No, I'm the customer. You're the worker. Spend money, then. I'm the customer. Mary. I got money. More money than you make. What you talking about? Drug what you going to take it? Drug money. Oh, now, oh, now we got... I'm drug. a customer. You're more than welcome to. Drug money? Drug money. Drug money? I feel... That ain't it, y'all. Miss Karen got some more Karen to do. Take off this video. Now I sell drugs. I'm doing it. Hold on, let me finish. Nothing is going on. Okay. I, I I deal with customers on a daily day basis. That's that's profiling. And what she did. Do you have something I can help you with? For her to come up and approach us like that in that manner, that is not right. Excuse me, ma'am. Oh, I don't. So if she don't get fired. Hold on. Wait a minute. Us coming in here laughing uh, automatically makes us drug dealers and, and shoppers. Or something. Cause that's what you assume. Cause dude, I shoplift anything. And you don't all right, have, so I'm like, no idea who we are. That that right there is not right at all. He could be an at attorney. All. There's no excuse. He could be a lawyer. He could be. And neither is what you guys did when I came up to you and said, "Can I help?" You don't have no. You don't come up to me. I ask everybody all the time, "Can I help you find something?" No, you didn't say that. Yes, I did. I said, "Don't talk to me like that." You don't come up to me with attitude. I'm a customer. 
You have no reason to be talking to me right now. You're going to answer to your superior for not backing me up. I'm a cut. What, what, what manager backs up an employee who argues with customers? You don't do that. Mary, I need you to walk away. That's not right. You tell him to stop. No, I need you to walk away. You tell him Mary, to stop. I need you to walk away now. Fine, Brandy. This is all. Wow, even it, even but come go against the manager. To this. You're going to yell at your manager? That's right. She ain't finished. This is how it ended, y'all. Check it out. And call me a drug dealer. I, I guarantee, I guarantee she don't get in trouble. Married. I never attacked you, Mary. All I told you to do is don't talk to me. I'm a customer. You're lucky I don't know your name, mister. Because no job is worth you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're on tape. Right now. You yell in your store. Follow me again, Mister, and I will break your damn marriage. Ah, come on, man! I'll bench press you. Nobody following me. Where are you at? No, no, no. She called me a drug dealer. She threw me a shoplifter. Where is that? He was over there. He's following me. You came over here. Don't let her know. Let her kill herself. No, no, no. We customers. Come on, I can spend money. I got money to spend. I want, do you guys have grievance forms? Grievance, grievance, my friend. This isn't grievance you need, but what you are witness is unadulterated white supremacy, and it is birthed out. This strength. Her ripping her jacket off, her seeing him as a drug dealer, her approaching them, her being angry that she's not being backed up. The superior that the manager has the answer to is not someone in Walmart. It's the white, the whiteness, the ideal of whiteness. How dare you stand with these black people against me? The woman, the manager said, I asked them to take their book bags off and they had no problem. That wasn't enough. These people are treating Walmart as a playground. And what, what does she mean? They were laughing. And they must be in there trying to spend their drug money if they have money. Here's, here's the problem. All of the nastiness that exists, this power that gives this, uh, this little old uh, woman the strength to stand up to these young black men is white supremacy. She's standing on the shoulder of racist giant. She is standing on the shoulders of that massive ode to white supremacy in Georgia. I don't care where she is. This is directly linked to our power and belief that Robert E. Lee was superior to somebody, that he was a great general. We cannot disconnect this. This behavior, Sharon, is disgusting for so many reasons. The idea that she's willing to sacrifice her income, the idea that she's willing to go back and scream at her manager, pull out a camera, come back after she's walked away and film the customer. This level, this level of whiteness how do you, what, what makes you believe that these people are drug dealers? Plus, I don't know drug dealers that shop in Walmart. That's, that's a, oh, just a personal note for any Karen that works at Walmart. Drug dealers ain't in there, dog. They ain't in there. <laughs> so uh, it's just, it's just disgusting on so many levels, Sharon, on so many levels. Yeah, it is. And they're getting more and more fierce. This old G Karen, this reality show reunion, ready to jump up and <laughs> do some damage, Karen. And you're right. The manager can't tell her nothing. Nobody is going to tell this Karen how to do her job. And apparently her job involves policing black men, policing young black people, which I believe is why she took the job mayor at Walmart. Just like you and I, I'm sure have discussed why certain people want to wear a police uniform because they want to feel that power. They want to feel like perhaps they're not over anybody else in their life. They have no control. But in this instance, with her name tag, with I think I had that little smiley. Is that a Walmart thing, the smiley face? I thought they just put it on the receipts that they check in black neighborhoods. Okay, they don't do it at every Walmart. Uh, but where was I? This old G Karen has got to be apprehended. She's vicious. She cannot be left to her own devices in the wild of aisle four or wherever she was. Watch your back. Yeah, it is, it is beyond dangerous when we see people act this way. And we know this could have, the terror of this is, some of these young boys don't play like older oh, general. They're not going to pull out their cameras. They're going to react in a different manner. And people don't that understand. Part. Approaching people in this manner can be extremely dangerous, not just for the people that you're approaching, but for the outcome. Because if, if they would have reacted in a different way, police would have been called. These boys could be dead. These young men could be dead right now. Oh. 
a school used offensive Jason Aldean song during an, uh, a school event. In Tennessee, the local NWCP chapter of Maury has, uh, sp- has spoken out against Columbia Central High School principal Michael Steele for a certain song choice used during a September football game. The song being uh, being Jason Aldean's Tritus in a Small Town, which was allegedly used in a pregame video montage honoring CHS players over the years. The decision comes a month after the video was shot in downtown Columbia and its imagery and lyrics garnering controversy. According to the report by Columbia Daily Herald, the process in choosing the song remains unclear. Sure it does, unclear. <laughs> Recap of the controversy behind the song and the music video. The Try This in a Small Town music video first sparked criticism in July for its use of Black Lives Matter protest footage and lyrics like, got a gun that my granddad gave me. They say one day they're going to round up. Well, that S might fly in the, in the city. Good luck. This video was pulled from CMT and the protest footage was subsequently edited out of the video. This is according to Entertainment Weekly. Here are some more lyrics from that song. Sucker punch somebody on a sidewalk, carjack an old lady at a red light. Pull a gun on the owner of a liquor store. Y'all think it's cool or act a fool if you like. Cuss out a cop, spit in his face, stump on the flag and light it up. Yeah, y'all think it's tough. Well, try that in a small town. See how far you make it down the road. Around here, we care. We take care of our own. You cross that line. It won't take long for you find out. I recommend you don't. Try that in a small town. And of course, these are lyrics from Try That in a Small Town by Jason Aldean. Uh, he goes some more details from the Daily Herald. In response to the song choice, local Maury NWCP representatives issued a letter to Steele and other school leaders following the September 29th game, voicing their grievance and requesting a meeting to discuss the matter. That's, of course, uh, the Columbia Daily Herald. This song has already been banned on several media outlets and social platforms across the nation. Uh, Maury uh, NWCP president Terry Hanna states in a letter, we want to go on record. That an, as an organization, we have received numerous complaints and called voice and major, major concerns. This song choice was very insensitive and a divisive display that they and their families were exposed to. The disturbs, uh, the disturbed looks on more attendees. I don't understand what that means. Uh, faces. Ver- oh, yeah. OK. The disturbed looked on many attendees faces visually expressed their disgust over the past couple of days. Complaints and negative comments turned into a full week of disbelief that again continued from the daily herald the letter goes on to request a meeting to discuss the song choice as well as raising awareness as to the sensitivities of taking community members into consideration who might consider it offensive still and other maury county school representative did not wish to go give comments at the time regarding this issue in speaking with the daily the daily herald hannah said initially that there were there have been communication between Steele and the nlsp following the letter submittal however Progress appears to be at a standstill for what the organization requests and that no formal meeting has yet been made or agreed to. We asked him to have a meeting with us, but he chose not to with uh, to meet with the committee of people, which I did not care for, uh, Hannah said. We plan to reach out again, uh, have him meet with us. Listen, you don't need I, I don't need to read this or understand or even figure out why we need to try to meet with this. I'm going to tell you why. This was a this was a direct this was a direct attack on anyone or any culture or idea of black equity. This song, that video was shot in that town. This video was shot in that town. Try this in a small town to me is false. I'm from a small town. I know a few things about uh, the redneck community. I'm not saying everybody listening to country music is a redneck. It's one of my favorite genres of music anyway. Uh, but I am saying Jason, Jason Aldean is fraud. Why Mundell is Jason Aldean fraud? First of all, he was born and raised in Macon, Georgia. Macon is 157,000 people, 60% black. He's not from a small town. He left there at 18, started touring with his band when he got signed promptly with a, a, a record label. When he got signed, he moved to Nashville. Nashville has almost 700,000 people. Jason Aldean knows nothing, nothing about living in a small town. He's never lived in a small town. He is not a small town guy. He's a very wealthy white man benefiting off of white people's fear and also the racism that's baked in to our history. He is disgusting for making this song. Also, can we be honest? Rednecks don't have positive interaction with police officers. I'm from a small town and I know rednecks don't like police officers. I don't care what people talk about back to blue and all the racist best baked into that statement. I know for facts it is it is rare and new 
that we have rednecks and people singing music to rednecks to make them believe that they like and have ever supported police officers. This is for my friends, my white friend from the trailer park. That is not my coming. That is knowledge that I know. So this is nothing but him playing that song was written to play off of just that feeling, this idea that we can separate more. This is the Southern white strategy, how we can separate Southern whites from Southern blacks and the things that we're going through. Try that in a small town is absolutely disgusting. And we know it for so many reasons. This school, these schools leaders choosing to choose this song and play it at a high school event is nothing but disgusting. And it was intentional. That's why they don't want to have a meeting. That's why they will not have a meeting. They don't care to change that behavior. They achieve what they wanted to achieve. They placated to the people they wanted to placate to. And that, my dear, is facts. Sharon? Facts for days and back to Jason Aldean. You know, you're so right. He is fraudulent. And the mayor of Columbia, Tennessee will tell you, the mayor said, hopefully somebody else, he'll take Dolly Parton, Carrie Underwood, anybody else, but this fraudster coming back and filming in that small town. But the mayor has a point here, and so do you, because it's clearly intentional. Let me sow division and let me see. Maybe that'll help me catch a flyer and get a hit record instead of just relying on my talent and my music. Let me sow controversy like somebody else I know who probably plays this at his rallies, okay, when he's not in court. Let me do that. It's just despicable, Mayor. And there is no reason to have a meeting unless you want to show up hat in hand and say, oh my goodness, I wasn't even paying attention. I was so busy. I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. And that's not going to happen because no one's sorry. Exactly, and I'm sorry. And then the president of the NAACP, Hannah, he added that you know this issue hits home personally to him as he was one of the players on the CHS field at the time the song was played. It was played on the night that were that they were honoring the all black high school football team, along with past players of the local uh, Columbia Central High School, of which I was one of the athletes. Also, Hannah said, when we were out on the field and the song was playing, we were like, what? going on. Hannah later said the ultimate goal is to simply ask Thiel to present a public apology for the song's choice and to discuss why it could be a sensitive subject for some. It's not about apologizing to us and our organization, but to do a public apology because he did it in a public setting. Hannah said he didn't he did it at a game, and so why can't he make an apology at the game? We definitely we're definitely not through with it at all and we're still awake on all this. Listen, this is this is this is this is not a one off. When he said that, when I read that, that this was an all black team that was being honored, that almost that almost just added fire to what I was talking about, Sharon. Y'all put Sharon up with me. This is this Sharon. We got to be honest. This is when we don't call this for what it is. Yep. We are setting ourselves up to pretend that this is we should be shocked about this. We don't need to be shocked. We need to know. So being awake about this, as 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 the uh, NWC president said, is is what we should constantly be awake to. Being woke is not a new thing for Black people. It has never been a bad thing to be woke. To be woke means to be aware of what's happening, the injustices that are happening to our people. And this song may seem small to others, but we're talking about the epigenetics that's associated with the, the lyrics, the sentiments that Aldean was trying to portray with this song. And it was trying to remind us that we had a place and we're out of line. He said, when you cross the line, you will find out. That is that is clan language, Sharon. That is clan language. Yeah, it is. And I wonder if any of the all black team was related to Henry Choate, who a lot of people won't even remember the name. 18 years old, lynched, 1927, family devastated, ripped apart, and just brutalized in the worst ways. That was the imagery. Okay, that courthouse, that's the imagery that was in Eldine's song. And so everything again is intentional, purposeful, and meant to inflict fear and harm. Uh, were they also called boy and told to pay attention? And recite the lyrics, Mayor, because I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case too. Yeah, and I mean, and even and, and even even Sharon, even the lyrics, like the play, you're trying to talk uh, in the vernacular that is African American vernacular. Y'all uh, think y'all y'all think it's yeah. cool? Act the fool, and you'll find out. This is people people miss these subtle uh, dog whistles, but for me, it's blaring. But it's it's blurring in a way that it shows me that you can be a fraud. Uh, Kid Rock, for instance, Jason Aldean, 
And then if you notice, right after the song came out, he went straight to Twitter, him and his wife, and was selling Trump T-shirts. Immediately made a bunch of money off selling Trump T-shirts. We see your messaging, Aldean. Your slip is showing is what my grandmother would say. We're going to take a break right now. I'm here with the great Sharon Reed filling in for Dr. Richie. Stick around. We're back, y'all. It's uh, Mundell Robinson filling in with Dr. Richie, and I'm so blessed to be here with Sharon Reed, the ever comfortable Sharon Reed. Don't forget, you got to get your copy of Ada Rodriguez's book, Legitimate Kid. Again, it's at shoptyt.com. And remember, it's a wonderful tale of how you can turn pain, actually how Ada turned her pain into laughter. So grab your signed copy today at shoptyt. Also, don't forget tomorrow, that's right, JR, Brett, and John are back at it as they cover the third Republican debate and pick up the night's biggest winners and losers. And also, if you are a TYT member, and if you're not, you should join tyt.com slash join where you can get the extended coverage. So please go sign up ASAP so you can see that. Trust me, it's going to be a, a colorful night. So what are, we, what are we talking about? What are our members talking about? What are we talking about over at, um, thank you so much, James, on YouTube for gifting one indisputable uh, membership. We appreciate that. Uh, also, thank you, Bernie, the Kiwi dragon, Bernie, the Kiwi dragon. Just wanted to say uh, if the Karen had accused me of selling drugs for a living, I tell her, as a matter of fact, I do because I'm a pharmacist. <laughs> I like that. That's pretty good. But I think that I think that the, the undercoding of that is, you know, you assume that someone is a drug dealer because of what? This is a critique of our society that you see a black man's face and you automatically assume that this person is a drug dealer. Why? Because he's a black man, what else could he do if he has money? Can't go to school, can't be a pharmacist, can't be a lawyer, can't be, you can't be anything except for a drug dealer because you're a black man. Well, over on uh, tyt.com, we have Funkin' for Fun said, we have 800 people in our town, nobody licking cop boots here. Exactly. That's all I'm saying. I'm from a small town. And while people, some people, especially the older generation, want to know where their police office off at the time, most of the time people are critical of how people are being treated. We saw it in every at, at the first story and the second story that we talked about today. Even the person that was filming the cops beat that man in Rock Hill. What she say, she started out saying, this is how they'll treat you in Rock Hill, implying that there is a culture that exists, a culture that is baked in in policing that we got to address. And speaking of addressing things, let's get back into this news because we got some more to go, y'all. And this story is so horrible. An Alabama mayor who's also a pastor took his own life after he was outed for being a cross jester. Uh, Floyd, uh, here we go, Bubba Copeland. An Alabama pastor and mayor took his own life last week after a conservative blog wrote a story about him wearing women's clothing as a hobby. Copeland's private life was exposed Wednesday by the conservative blog 1899, I'm sorry, 1819 News, which was once owned by the right wing Alabama Policy Institute and whose top editor is a former Breitbart News contributor. The post written by reporter Craig Munger. Oh, my God. This is, this is a doozy. 1819 News published a username uh, to Copeland's Reddit and Instagram account, writing that he posed in various outfits, some more racy than others. The blog also said that Copeland used the pseudonym Brittany Blair Summerlin and posted porno, pornography, and pornography and advised on chemically transitioning. The blog reported that Copeland, a Republican, confirmed that the account were run by him, saying that uh, they, they were a hobby he used for getting rid of stress. 1819 News reported that Copeland asked him or asked them not to out him, but they did it anyway, even though it does not appear he had taken any public positions against LGBTQI issues that could be uh, construed as hypocritical. Now, all right, I need to stop right here. The fact that this is news is absolutely not this man taking his life, but that 1819 blog needed to cover this. If, why aren't they digging into other people's hobbies unless they're trying to sensationalize what has happened to this man or what could happen? What would be the result of a pastor, a conservative pastor that's also an elected official cross-dressing to, re to relieve stress? Someone hobby to relieve stress. What, what, other, what other instinct do we have of them covering someone's hobby? None. 
This this was intentional. And especially when we know this person has no stance on this issue. This was intentional. This is absolutely intentional and it's disgusting. And I'm going to tell you why it's disgusting uh, when we get into it. But let's get back into it. Fallout from, from being outed. Copeland's extracurricular activities quickly turned into a community-wide con- controversy. His church referred to unbiblical behavior in a statement, and Copeland reportedly told his par- his parishioners that this article did not represent who or what I am. He added that it would not cause my life to change. Mm. And that, of course, is according to the Daily Beast. The uproar took a tragic turn on Friday when Lee County Sheriff Jay Jones said the deputies who tried to pull Copeland over for a welfare check witnessed Copeland step out of his car and shoot himself. Shoot himself. Craig Munger responded to the criticism. Defendants, his reporting on X, formerly as Twitter, Munger responded to a since-deleted tweet saying, digging up someone's personal life is reporting on what someone posts publicly on social media. Interesting take. In a separate post responding to criticism, Munger wrote, pictures posted to Reddit are now considered private. According to the kitty table of Alabama media, Munger has not posted since Copeland's suicide. This is this is the this is the ridiculous, Sharon, in which these people are willing to go to defend this behavior. This is disgusting behavior. This is not news. We did not need to know about this person called dressing as a as a point of relief. Uh what what I don't understand why we needed to cover his hobby. You did this, but this is the history of Breitbart. People might forget this. Breitbart became big and a household name off of some controversial stuff like this that could have ended, actually ended someone's career. Shirley Sherrod, when Barack Obama was president, Shirley Sherrod, who's a daughter of a civil rights hero and a civil rights hero in herself because of the farmland she lost and then fought against the USDA in the uh, Pitchford settlement, uh, choosing to not take that settlement. Shirley Sherrod herself was targeted by Barack Obama's administration immediately responding to a fake fake uh, coverage from Breitbart in this very same uh, sense, saying that she discriminated against white farmers when she didn't. Um, and Barack Obama said she should be fired. She eventually did get fired, was offered her job back after they dug in and found out that it was false. The case in this case, though, the difference in this case is we can't offer this this mayor, this pastor, a job back. Even though he was doing the Lord's work, we can't bring him back to continue that work because he killed himself. Someone at 18, 19 should have had the conscience to listen to him asking, begging not to be outed. Sharon, what are you saying about this? Well, I'm just looking at 18, 19, and I suppose they can't apologize. They can't do what would be moral, ethical, decent, because they're too busy with other stories about how to ban, build a ban medically altering gender. Okay, you see where we're going with this uh, attack against progressives who don't have enough respect and are too woke. So it goes on and on and on that someone is taking the time to, I guess, um, well, there's probably not much research that goes into this. You wanted to be in this man's bedroom, okay? And his wife was already there and it was none of your business, 1819. I am so sad that this is where we are in 2023, no matter where you are in the world, that a man felt so attacked, so cornered, so outed, or whatever. I hate that he explained any of it. And now he's gone. And now he's gone. Public service in two forms, in the in the political, in the governing, governing space, and then also at the uh at the helm of a church. This is absolutely ridiculous. And if people think you're doing the God, you're doing God's work by outing someone for their hobby, you're not. There's not there's no Christian in no Christianity in this. Jesus had nothing to do with behavior like this. He was a, a speaker, a bilingual minority born in a, a oppressive regime under the helm of an oppressive regime that did not speak up for this behavior. It is tacky. Um, and the, and and I can't believe that this is what they call conservative in 2023. We should also note that for these people who are lovers of small, small government. How small are we talking about? So much so that you can get in someone's dress, so much so that you can be in someone's bedroom. That it's not small government when you have this level of, of, of oversight. And I, people keep saying, why are you talking about government and we're talking about media? Media has been referred to as the fourth arm of government, and we need to acknowledge that. Landlord said apartment with kids on fire over unpaid rent. Uh, in New York, a uh, Islam, uh, Mr. Islam, a, a New York City landlord, 
upset about unpaid rent, set a staircase on fire with the second floor tenant still inside, causing them to toss their kids down to the neighbors from the roof. Authority said six children and two adults had to be rescued. He is facing eight counts of attempted murder, arson, and also assault. Background on the incident. Here it is. The fire happened September 26th at a two-story apartment building in Brooklyn. Investigators soon found videos showing an unidentified man wearing a mask and a hood enter and leave the building where the fire took place before the 911 call was placed. Officials told New York Station WPIX, uh, David Harrison, Law and Crime. Witness accounts of the rescue, uh, Mr. Mr. Islam, unclear on the relation to the suspect. This is a different Islam. This is Shatav Q, uh, told the uh, outlet he and his roommates were sleeping on the building's first floor when they were awoken by someone screaming fire. They ran outside and to their back, uh, we we are all outside, and then we see on the roof like six kids and a mother. They are all on the roof, and father, and their father, uh, Mr. Islam. Of course, this is not the landlord. This is the second Islam. Said they're trying to throw the kids off the roof and tell us take them, take them. Again, Mr. Islam said this. He and his roommates caught four of the kids, and the parents jumped. Firefighters went into the home and rescued the other two kids. Law and crime had to say this. According to WCBS, seven people were taken to the hospital with minor injuries. The fire department said 60 fire and EMS personnel responded to the scene, and it took an hour to get it under control. Islam had allegedly threatened, this is not the Islam that saved them, this is a different one, had allegedly said, threatened to cut off the gas and electricity to tenants in the past, WPIX reported. He had also previously threatened to set the home on fire if the rent continued to be unpaid. Officials reportedly told the station, when the fire first started, people speculated it was him. Our neighbors told the local CBS affiliate WCBS, I just see him unusually just walking around, going house to house to the houses that he owns, but I'm just shocked that he got arrested. Rafik Islam uh, remains in jail record show. Listen, I don't understand how in the world uh, these threats were, were allowed to go along and why people didn't report this before it happened. If you're threatening people to burn them down because they can't pay rent, this is, this is, this is tyranny. This is tyranny. This is uh, beyond criminalizing poverty. This is killing people because they're poor. And we sit idle in this country more and more as people's rent continue to be raised. And also we see landlords act in this manner with no defense for people who can't survive in an economy that sometimes is not even equipped or built for them. Sharon, what are your take? On, uh, I, I know what your takes are, but you share them in your words. Well, yeah. And I mean, you mentioned that last part, and that's where I was going to go at some point, too. I don't know if this was rent control. First of all, none of that matters. Okay. But before you talk about, and I'm a landlord, I've had people not pay. Where you talk about people who they signed a contract, they're supposed to pay rent, they're not. And so this man's upset and maybe went temporarily out of sorts. This is a tough country to just survive in, not thrive. We're not nearly there to just survive. And when you look at the pictures, Mayor, the aftermath, sometimes people make threats and they intend to make good on them. First, it was the gas and electricity. He was going to shut that off. And then who, who says something like that? I'm going to burn the place if you don't pay. And then he does it. When you look at those pictures, God, those kids, that family shouldn't be with us today. It's by the grace of something, a higher power that they are. It's despicable. This is, you know, there's attempted murder and then there's attempted murder. He meant to kill these people. And 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 absolutely, he absolutely meant to, and, and, and I'm a I'm an advocate for uh, you know, uh a, a just justice system. A just justice system does not allow this case to be handed with a soft hand. This is absolutely ridiculous. There were six children in an apartment. Six children and two adults. And what, what people might breeze over uh, in my stuttering when I was reading uh, is that two of those kids had to be rescued by the fire department, which means the parents had to leave. They had to make a decision for their lives and the kids that they had already put down. 
that they need to jump off the roof. And the fire department, thank God, were able to go back in and rescue those two kids. So that for that was a period in these parents' life where they didn't know if their kids were going to burn to death. The time between the fire department's rescuing them and, and them getting their kids back. This is absolutely disgusting. And what does it take? What position is a parent in to say, I need to throw my kid off a roof in order for them to survive? We're going to take a break. We'll be back. Uh, I'm with Sharon. I'm Mundell filling in for Dr. Richie. We're back with uh, viewer comments um, over at TYT.com. Mo Furry said, unbiblical, unbiblical behavior is an insidious phrase. If Jesus came back, according to the Bible, he'd be less interested in what people wear or who they love and be most cons mostly concerned with why his Palestinian brothers and sisters are killing each other. I would, I would agree with that statement with one alteration. I think Jesus will be concerned with why any of us are killing each other. Uh, this idea of physical violence was not a part of what Jesus stood for. We're not talking about uh, all violence because we know there were some righteous indignations. When we saw Jesus destroy property. We saw him uh, flip over the money, ta money tables and et cetera. But physical violence, he, he was not for. We saw that when he put the ear back on uh, those who attacked him or were coming to attack him. Uh, uh, Funkin for Fun said, Guy looked like he needed a hug. We're talking about the mayor that was out. He said a guy looked like he needed a hug so bad, and all he got was hatred. This is this is. I mean, we have to acknowledge that 1819 in this manner showed up less like a journal uh, or, or people trying to cover the the news, and more like a bully. Uh, when someone is asking you not to out them, it is it is it is a decision that is extremely personal. You know, you do not consider you're not considering when you out someone you out someone. You're not considering what it's going to do to their family dynamics their work dynamics, and in this case, their life. So they absolutely have a role that they need to own for. Uh, over on YouTube, uh, Hal Wasserman said, do you think anyone at that newspaper lost one night of sleep over this? Uh, I strongly doubt it, and I agree with you 100%. There's no need to add more to that because that's that's exactly how I felt. Because if they did or if they thought they would have, they would not have outed this man in the first place. So it is, it is absolutely uh, ridiculous. And, and Bernie, the Kiwi dragon, said the landlord should have one of his properties confiscated and given to the family. I Listen, I, I, I honestly think we need to start thinking about restorative justice in this manner. You tried to burn these people to death. And you really did that because you burnt, you didn't just set their apartment on fire, which would have been bad by itself. You set their way out. You set the second floor, the stairwell leading up to their house on fire. That is absolutely disgusting. And, and I think, you know, that for, for me and people to see the world like Bernie the Kiwi Dragon, we are not, we're not, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, let's get back to the news. And this, my friends, is some interesting news. Death rule. Suge Knight claims Deion Sanders primetime owes him money for albums. Check out this video. Deion Sanders. Yep. When Prime wanted to be a rapper, he said, I want to be a rapper. He had an agent named Gene, who was a great dude, rest in peace, Gene. I spent over a half a million dollars of my own money. I put guys in the studio, I paid down in Austin, I did all these songs, did everything. Wow. Then one day he came to me and said, well, you know, Prime did with um, Nike, and Death Row is a black-owned company. And we don't want to really deal with a black-owned company, even though you pay for everything and you sign, uh, we signed to you, put us on the Interscope label wow. brand. So I go to Jimmy and say, look, I pay for everything. The contract's with me, but could you put him out on Interscope? They're like, oh, yeah, I do that for you. Anything for you, Mr. Knight. And so if I'm at Prime or Forming somewhere, I'm taking a private plan to make sure everything's good. But not one day did anybody gave me a dollar back. That's crazy. Not one so so you know, Deion Sanders was you, signed to Death Row originally. It, he was only signed to Death Row. Must be the money that they play on uh, uh, commercials yep. and all that. Those checks should have been coming this way, <laughs> you know? That's, we're not done, y'all. Check out what Sanders had to say in response. So I said to Snoop, oh, I said, heart. we should... Reissue, remaster your album because you were signed to Death Row. And I, I really was, but since it was called Death Row and I was at the height of my endorsements, I couldn't really ride like this. But Snoop, Dance Corrupt, all of them came down to Atlanta to start working on the album. And I can remember um, the beat from Lady Rage. I rocked Rough and Tough with my Afro Puffs. That was my beat that Corrupt wrote a track for me. 
untouched young black pro so here we go my mind stays massive so check my flow i'm erotic like madonna i'm in a fonda way to creep silently like a stealth bomb you want to tangle from every <laughs> angle you hit you ain't no prime could rock a microphone like this tittle tatter <laughs> bitter batch of bad ones i hit them with the force of a magnum <laughs> when i'm rolling with my homies in the daytime i regulate things when i display right i'm back even though i never left it's debated how i'm underrated but the best rewind it's the prime time so check it uh -huh. oh. 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 oh that's corrupt oh. that's corrupt Whoa. So I, let me remind people, Suge Knight was one of the most influential and controversial figures in the music industry in the 1990s. Thanks to his role as the CEO of the legendary Death Row Records, which launched the careers of Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and Tupac. However, he claimed he also played a major role in putting another, another name on the map, Deion Sanders, who supposedly did him dirty after linking up with the label. There's no doubt Deion Sanders had uh, continued to live up to the reputation he earned during his playing days since taking over as the head coach of Colorado. As he used the cockiness and swagger that's full, that's still on full display in Boulder to cement himself as the undisputed superstar he was in the 90s. That's, of course, according, according to Connor Tool over at Bro Bible. The, this, the man known as Primetime certainly kept himself busy while simultaneously playing in the NFL and MLB. But in 1994, he decided to throw even more uh, on his plate by adding musical artists to his resume. His debut album wasn't exactly a hit with critics, although he did get a fair amount of airtime thanks to the single Must Be The Money. While it is widely believed Sanders leveraged his friendship with MC Hammer to bring that pivot uh, to fruition, Suge Knight disputed uh, that was actually the case during a uh, recent conversation with Nick Cannon's podcast where he asserted he dropped hundreds of thousands of dollars to get his career off the ground only to get kicked into the curb still by a uh, bro Bible Sanders previously revealed he was in, interested in signing with death row although his recollection of what went down is a bit different he implied the name of the label as well as some of the negative attention surrounding it at the time had the potential to put uh, endorsement deals with other brands in jeopardy, which is why he declined to have an official affiliation. Listen, let me tell anybody something that don't know anything about Suge Knight. Suge Knight is on is in prison for a long time. Also, nobody owes Suge Knight money and didn't pay him. Period. In the nineties or ever, the guy would do crazy stuff. He would, literally went to jail for putting a rattlesnake in someone's mailbox. Suge Knight did not not get paid. Suge Knight hung Vanilla Ice over a balcony to take the rights of his song. This is this is this is false news from Suge Knight. Suge Knight did not spend his own money and didn't get paid. He took all Dre's money and all of the rights to Dre's music when Dre left. We know this. This idea that he told Interscope, "Okay, sure you can have Dion. I'm not paying my own money." This is this is fanciful. Um, this is not the Suge Knight that we know. Even some of the own artists like Suge, like Snoop Dogg. Uh, said that because they were in a different gang, they were Crips and Suge was blood, they would go to the theater, uh, to the to the studio with guns because it was regular for people to get beat up in the studios by those bloods. So this is just not, this is not what happened. Maybe you had a relationship with Deion Sanders, absolutely, but you did not spend $500,000 of your own money. Also, Suge Knight does not own Death Row, so that money wouldn't go to him. If Death Row sued Deion Sanders for money that they put into him, Snoop actually owns all of Death Row. Publishing, distribution, and also all of the rights to all of the music. So there's that. Sharon? Well, you said it just about it all, Mayor. And I think you broke it down perfectly, analyzed it just right. Um, I saw an interview recently with Vanilla Ice. He he did say that, you know, much of that happened. And by the way, all these years later, he was happy to go ahead and sign away and give Suge a couple points on the album because, hey, what's, you know, few points among friends, if you will. I think the larger issue here is Dion is hot. Snoop might want to collab with him. And so let's get the music going again and see what happens with prime time. The song that he had before Mayor was called what? Must be the Must money. Be money. <laughs> right. So Suge, what are you talking about? Now come on now. Right. And I mean like the idea that Suge is saying that he branded Deion Sanders, he made Deion Sanders cocky. Oh, man. His bravado is absolutely ridiculous. We know Deion Sanders when he was running the 440, which is something athletes do in the combine when they leave in college, going to go to the end. This this is a man who got out in a tuxedo with no <laughs> shirt on, ran the 40, I ran straight to his limo and left. 
That was I the forgot. answer. That is that Man. is prime time. He was prime time all the time. And he so, hung out with MC Hammer too. So I mean, Dion had didn't. a lot of friends in the entertainment industry. He could still pick up the phone, call anybody he wants, and get any deal he wants. Yeah, and I think I think like you said, right now might be the perfect time for Snoop or whoever to rekindle that relationship, whatever it was back then, because he, now it's not just him. He got his son who has the highest paid college athlete ever. Right. He making five million dollars a year as a college quarterback. So maybe Snoop got a, a Sanders group in the making. Prime Let's time go on after, tour. Right? <laughs> Here comes the tour, Mayor. Yeah, speaking of tour. Uh, let's get into Atlanta's dining scene, right? Uh, Atlanta dining scene shook up by food vlogger Keith Lee. UFC fighter turned food credit critic Keith Lee has caused a stir in Atlanta area after sitting uh, sitting in town and reviewing some of the city's most talked about eateries. Some people applauded him for the honest take on the grub uh, and co-signed many of his observations. Here's an example of him calling out preferential treatment by Atlanta restaurants. Me and my family are in Atlanta, and currently we are at the Real Milk and Honey. I got it. Let's try it and rate it 1 through 10. As you can see, I don't have any bags in my hands. We are at the Real Milk and Honey on Main Street and College Park. Before we came, we attempted to call our order in. We were greeted with an automatic message that said they do not take call-in orders. The automatic message said the only way you can do pickup is through DoorDash. We went through DoorDash. They was closed. But online, it said they closed at 5 o'clock. We went on DoorDash at 4 o'clock. But we were already here, so we just went inside. I stayed in the car and my family went in and they told them they were closed early for deep cleaning. Yet the door is wide open and it's people still going in and grabbing orders. Now we have no idea if those people ordered beforehand or what the case is. Also, the people who relayed this message, my family said were really nice. It's just the rules. And so far being in Atlanta, I found some places do have unique rules. To me and my family, the rules just went for us. We just not their target audience. For the record, afterwards, I did walk in and they did recognize me and they attended the services, but I respectfully declined. I'm a normal person. I pay for my food like everybody else. Yesterday, me and my family were at the One Music Festival. Somebody who works with Candy Birds walked up to us and said they've been trying to reach us since we we got to Atlanta. He said he'd been constantly emailing me and constantly DMing me for me to come to Old Lady Gang. I got it. Let's try it and rate it 1 to 10. As you can see, I don't have any bags in my hands. Me and my family showed up and we attempted to order before we got here. We called the number they had connected on Yelp three times. No answer. We tried to order through DoorDash and it said it was temporarily closed. So when we pulled up, I sent my family in to order for us. They said on the weekends, due to being busy, they don't do any takeout at all. Thank you to go order. No, we don't do to order on the weekend. Oh, okay. So send in dining. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sweetie. We appreciate you. Which is completely understandable. So what we decided to do is my family's going to go eat. They're going to come bring the food out while I'm sitting in the car. So they have no idea I'm here. My family asked how long the wait was to be seated. They said an hour to an hour and a half. Yeah, hour and a half. Okay. She also said they didn't have any reservations available. So they didn't take out any number, any contact information, nothing. My family then came and relayed that message to me. And I decided to go in myself. We walked in and we were greeted by a nice young lady. And then I met some amazing people who were eating there. And we took some pictures. God is amazing. As soon as me and my wife were done taking pictures, the lady said the table was ready. As always, I don't want any special treatment. I want to be treated like everybody else. I pay for my food like everybody else. I'm a normal person. I'm a normal customer. Things like this is exactly why I do reviews the way I do. Just because I have a certain amount of followers on social media don't make me different from nobody. My mom, my mom-in-law, my sister, they all paying customers just like me. So I want them to be treated just like me. So I asked how long the wait time has been today. She said an hour to an hour and a half. So which I then asked, how are you able to sit me in five minutes? This is her response. How long was that for? I'm just going to sit up Again, my family just attempted to eat there less than two minutes ago. I didn't tell her. I changed my mind. We're going to go eat somewhere else. And I said, God bless you. And I walked out. So people might be upset, but listen, there are some famous people, especially Cardi B, that co-signed what Lee said. Check out this video where she's telling us this. Like first thing first, right? I feel like Atlanta restaurants they don't like to make money. I feel like they don't like people. They don't like their customers. They just don't like it. First thing first, right? You could barely order in Atlanta restaurants. Like you go like, hey, I would like to make order. Oh yeah, we don't make, we don't we don't take orders. We don't take orders. It gets to the point that I literally have to name like I have to tell like people that order food for me like, can you just name drop my name? Because first and first, they just don't they don't do no pickup orders. They don't do deliveries. They just don't do. Second, Atlanta restaurants, right? They be closed on the most random. Like it's like you look at a rest, you go looking for a restaurant on Google, and it's like, oh, this look good. Oh, they closed. Is that? What do you mean? Listen, while people like Candy Burris, the owner of Old Eddie Gang, appreciated Lee's feedback, 
the owner of The Real Milk and Honey, were initially dismissive of it. I got to be honest. Listen, I spent a lot of time in Atlanta, a lot of time in Atlanta because my business is headquartered there, uh, Black Male Voter Project. Sharon, you, you, you know this true. Cardi B and Keith are not wrong. They think it's a badge of honor to give someone special privilege. And what he's saying is absolutely correct. I am wrecked. When you do this, you cause more, you cause more havoc. You make yeah. people, people that have been sitting there waiting an hour, watch this person walk in because they may be famous or in this case, internet famous, and they get the seat immediately. It's absolutely disgusting. That is not how you want to be treated as a customer. I think if we're considering how Michelin star do their reviews where they're blind reviews, Keith, you done a wonderful job of showing you that even though you know my face because of who I read out, who and how I reviews, when you give me that preferential treatment, it's not going to be beneficial for your brand. And let's be clear, customer service is not what it is in, 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 in Orlando, where Disney World is in Orlando, especially on the restaurant screen. Uh, Sharon? It's a problem, Mayor. And I love this city. I do not wish to trash it in any way. But we have to speak the truth, okay? You remember when Vegas was known for like horrible food? It wasn't that long ago. Collectively, the city cleaned up its act, and now they have five-star restaurants. They invited the best chefs in, the best establishments. Atlanta has to do better. Keith Lee is a treasure. He's honest. He's humble. Food is just his passion. And anybody who would dismiss someone like that, I like criticism. As long as it's honest, you can grow from it. But Cardi's right too, Mayor. They act like, you know, we're doing them a favor at some of these restaurants instead of making it a nice customer experience. It's actually ridiculous. I can think of one where you have to go there, wait in line to place your order. They won't do anything over the phone. Now, come on. Is that fair, Mayor? It's not fair at all. I mean, listen, and New York Times covers some of the effects of this, right? Some restauranteers say they saw results for better or worse after Mr. Lee's visit. One restaurant uh, after a glowing review sold out the first time in the history. Wow. And it had to, to extend its hours. Another restaurant where Mr. Lee had a frustrating experience is uh, its inbox quickly filled up with vitriol and threats. Those are the two sides of what some have called the Keith Lee effect. And I mean, listen, the idea that someone is shedding light on your on your restaurant, bigger, 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 small, you should take advantage of that. And that the dismissive nature of what we saw from the real milk and honey is probably why people feel the way they do about that restaurant. And while the food is good, it's only good when you can get it. And, and most of the time you're frustrated with the experience. Sharon, tell people where they can follow you um, and find you. At Sharon Reed Live, let me go to Keith Lee's uh, blog too, because I want to see where I want to eat tonight and what I should avoid. Sharon Reed Live across all platforms, Mayor, and also TYT Sports. I just love being on with you, and I learn from you every single time. You're my you're my new bestie, so <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, listen, I'm Mundell Robinson. You can find me at Mundell Robinson everywhere. This is Indisputable with Dr. Richie. We thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day, and don't do it before you think about it. Peace. Indisputable is still the fastest growing news show in America compared to CNN, Fox News, and 30 other networks. We tell the truth on Indisputable because the truth is indisputable. We go places that other news media outlets refuse to go. When there were human rights abuses happening at the Victorville prison, guards and members of the community contacted us. You, through your investigative reporting, unearthed very troubling allegations about specific forms of abuse and discrimination in the federal prison system. It really doesn't take much to be a trusted voice. All it takes is to be fearless, report on matters, be an advocate. I called it the bullpen intentionally because it's a place of preparation. We present individuals who may have an opposing view, so we debate. Sometimes we interview individuals because their stories deserve to be heard. A survivor of significant police misconduct and his attorney. We covered this story earlier and remind you of the horror of one man being shot at damn near 100 times by the police. We take time on this show to showcase the temper tantrums of Karens in the wild. We do this not because we want to see people's emotional outbursts in public, but because these incidents are emblematic of a bigger societal issue taking place across the nation, and it has to be checked. My friend, my big homie, attorney at law, Benjamin Crump. I just want to thank you, man, when educated, articulate brothers like yourself speak truth to power. 
it makes a great difference in changing the landscape in America. Listen, no matter what you do, don't allow the politics of ideology to evaporate the soul that still exists inside of you. They don't stop, I don't stop. Racism won't stop, I won't stop. Systemic bias won't stop, I won't stop. People still need health care, so I won't stop. People still need criminal justice systems reform, so I won't stop. You won't stop either.